Well, hey, we're in our sermon series, Renovated, and um, we, we, we're, there's a couple things when you think about renovation, and part of it is the church, the local body of believers. Um, one of the reasons that we started meeting together here uh, before we had our grand opening, um, you know, a year and a half ago, was the hearts and mind of the people that were here, the small group of people that wanted to help plant this church, we need to be renovated as a church just so we can have a time like you just had where we stood up and greeted each other um, just so people who don't feel comfortable meeting new people uh, who want to go to church here and be a part of that would have the courage to know that they got to get outside themselves and hopefully make somebody else feel welcome. And that's not natural to everybody, but it is a mission of ours to serve people's family and grow their ministry. It's our vision, right? And so to grow your ministry, you have to get outside yourself and be like Christ. And Christ didn't come to serve, to be served, but to serve and give his life for ransom for many. That's a popular verse, and we say it a lot, but it's true. And so as a church, we need to be renovated, but also as individuals. The church is the local gathering of believers, and it's made up of believers, And so there's a few things that we have to do to be renovated. And I don't think they're always apparent to us. And today, we're going to dive right in. Now, one of the statements I made on the first week, uh, and I've been gone a few weeks, so it's good to be back. But one one of the the statement that I made on the first week at the end of the message uh, was a reality check. We need to remember some truths about the church and about you. So here here they are. I want you to kind of go through with, uh, with me through this. The church is more than it seems, okay? Why do I say that? Well, the church is more than it seems because if you're living in the world and if you're going through community and you're doing your job and you're, you're just living normal life, right, you might have a tendency to think, well, the church is receding in different areas. The church is maybe receding in America. Maybe it seems like it's in trouble. You know, there's 51 countries where it's illegal to be a Christian, uh, but but. You, you know, the truth of God, maybe maybe you think, well, maybe the church is kind of broke, and, is it, and, and there are churches that maybe have quit preaching the gospel who don't, who, who don't uh, recognize the Bible as the Word of God, and, and they probably are receding, and they probably should recede. And, but that's being replaced by a movement, in our case, the restoration movement, who, with churches full of growth and, and, and people being baptized in the Word of God. Being, but listen, here's the thing about the church that God promises. It's the bride of Christ, and it will be here until he comes back. Um, that, that That promise isn't for a parachurch ministry, a campus ministry, K Love, a Christian bookstore, those things aren't promised to be here. But you know what is promised to be here? The bride of Christ, which is the local gathering of believers, really globally. That will that will be here. So here's why I say the church is more than it seems. Cross the line is more than it seems. And and, and here's biblically what the church is. It's an outpost, like, like, uh, you know, for a military, uh, it's an outpost from heaven where people can come and hear the truth and be redeemed. That's what the church is. The local gathering of believers, because of all the gifts of the body of Christ, is a place where people can come and hear the truth and be redeemed back to Christ, back to God. It, you are more than you seem. If you're here and you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior in Christ, you're more than you seem. That's what the Bible says. Uh, because um, you're not uh, who the world looks at you. You know, the world looks at the kind of the sum of who you are, your past deeds, your past sins. They accuse you of it. But listen, this is not what, this is not, that's not the biblical thing. The biblical thing is you're a warrior carrying the banner of the Most High God. That's who you are. In Christ, that's who you are. You may not have remembered that or thought about it, or you're, maybe you need to realize it for the first time or, or realize it again, but you're never going to be who you are in the bride of Christ at the church unless you realize what the truth of the gospel is. You know, the gospel is good news. It's not sometimes news. It's not part of the time. It's not back when you were 12 or 15, if you're excited. No, it's all the time good news. So when we believe it, what's the, what's the good news? Well, here's the other part of this. The world's in trouble. 
The world's in trouble. When you talk about being renovated, sometimes we don't know how. We don't know where to start. Well, here's where to start. Because some, some people stand with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and they're kind of embarrassed about the foot that's in the church. Well, let me just tell you something. The truth of the Bible says that the world's in trouble. It's broken. It's not going to be saved, the world. And so this is important to remember when you're talking about being renovated. Um, It's kind of like this. It it will be judged for its sin. The world won't make it. It, It's like like a ship that won't reach its destination. It's a plane that will end in a crash. It only has one destination, and it's the wrath of the Most High God. That's the only option for the world. It cannot be redeemed until God uh, remakes everything at the end. Its destination is it's in trouble. And and so I think sometimes we get on a plane or a ship or something with the world, and and we think, well, we're okay. You're not okay. You're absolutely not okay in the world. But that's the lie. And, And let me tell you, the good news is you don't have to stay there. you got a different option. And the church is more than it seems, especially one like you're sitting in this morning connected all over the world with bodies of believers where people are getting one to Christ, being baptized to Christ, and living their life to where other people accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Well, knowing this, knowing these things about the church is more than it seems, that you're in Christ, you are way more than you seem, even maybe that you realize, and the world is in trouble, how do we do better? How do we do better? I mean, when we walk out of here, it, it, when you're a child of God, when you walk from here with me, with the rest of this congregation this morning, in which this may be your first few times, listen, if you love Jesus, you're, you're walking out of here with the banner of the Most High God, with the truth in your heart and on your lips and walking in, in your shoes. And how, how do we do that? How do we do better? Because some of us can feel stuck. Some of us have been a Christian a long time and we feel irrelevant. We don't feel like a child of the Most High God carrying his banner, sitting this morning in an outpost of heaven where people could come hear the truth of the gospel, do you? Some people walked in there with a different idea. We've forgotten what the Bible says. We've forgotten what the good news is. The world does that to us, by the way. It may be that some of you guys need to join midweek group. Listen, it's a Christian life. It's not a Christian once in a while. But listen, if you're here for your Christian once in a while, hear me this morning. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. Now, sometimes when we read Scripture, we don't understand it. We're, we're going to understand the verses we read this morning. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, as exiles, so as, as castaways, to, to abstain from passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. What in the world is this talking about? Well, the passions of the flesh, materialism, you know, needing to indulge in us, uh, immoralities. Uh, lying, all, all the things uh, that would break God's law, the Ten Commandments, the things that we know are sin. Listen, those are in our flesh. The, the flesh is in the world. We're, we're living in this world. And when we satisfy those passions, listen, that wages war against your soul. Now, a lot of people, you, what do you think of when you think of the word soul? A lot of people think about this wrong. I'm going to help you learn. Biblically, what does the Bible refer to as soul? Now, when you, when you refer to God, right, We know that because of the Bible, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's one God, three in one, right? Trinity. And and do you know that you're walking around, God has made you in his image, and you're a trinity of trinities. And and I want to teach you about that this morning. Maybe you know, maybe you've never heard. But you're walking around in a body, right? This body doesn't last forever. And uh, yet the Bible says that you have a spirit, an eternal spirit. And your spirit gets saved the day you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. After you're saved, you get baptized right here on the stage. Many people have done that. Many people have signed up to do that in the coming weeks. And so the body and the spirit isn't the same because the body's going to die. This body's going to get old. It wears out. Uh, It it can't be reconciled until we get our new one. We get a new body that lasts forever, the Bible tells us, but this isn't it. So the body dies, but the spirit never dies. It's eternal, and it's instantly saved. Isn't that interesting? What's the soul? The thought, the mind, everything that makes you, you, your personality, the Bible calls that the soul. And the soul is being saved, being transformed and renewed, being renovated. 
And so a lot of times, whatever you say when you mean soul, the Bible's trying to tell you something different. Listen, your soul is being waged war against by when you let give in to the passions of the flesh. When you serve you and you're not worried about what God's worried about, it wages war against everything that makes you you. Isn't that interesting? Well, I told you, we're going to learn what these scriptures mean. The scripture also says that live such good lives or keep your conduct amongst uh, the world, amongst Lincoln, Nebraska, here, wherever you live, all your neighbors and friends, wh wherever that is, keep such good lives that when they speak against you, right, they remember your past, they remember who you used to be, they remember a sin that you did last week or whatever. Live such good lives, start changing, be transformed and renewed in your soul. Why? so that they'll see God and glorify him on the day of visitation. What's that saying? This is winning people from where they're at. And it's a prediction on where they end up because of your life. You know what it turns out? It turns out that your life really matters. Now, that's not Austin's take on the Bible. That's the truth of the, the gospel because it's really good news. Apparently, everything that you do in your life really matters. Other people's salvation actually depends on it. This is what this passage tells us. But because we live in a sinful world, but and because we're selfish, amen, can I get an amen? We're selfish, right? Amen. I mean, this morning, if we're cold, we got to get a coat for me. It's cold outside. When it's one degree outside and the wind's blowing in Lake of Nebraska, it's time to get selfish. You better have some shelter. You better get warm. You better get some food, right? You better cover up when you go outside. It's cold out here. And, and, and listen, we live in a world, so we, we, we're used to protecting us. But when it switches over, when we can't think about God, when we're, we're no longer being transformed, renewed, any of those things, uh, we get selfish. So here's what I want us to think about this morning. What about the things that have happened to you? You know, when we're remembering that we're a part of the bride of Christ, when we're remembering that you're more than anyone thinks you are, when, you're, when we're remembering that the world's in trouble, what about the really bad things that have happened to you? I mean, I mean the unfair things. I mean the stuff where you end up in a gutter. And I want to tell you this morning, no matter what age you are, whether you're in grade school, middle school, or high school, or you're many years into being an adult, um, you can feel like you're in the gutter. In fact, most of the stuff that adults can't forgive happened to them when they were a kid. Amen? We know that. Many of the abuses and the things that are wrongful happen to us when we're a kid, we're innocent, or we're young in this life, and, and, and listen, it's hard to get over them. I'm talking about the really bad stuff. And you can have relationships and situations that destroy you on the inside at any age. Amen? At any age, you can have stuff, situations, and things that happen to you that hurt you on the inside. How do we deal with that? How do we get better knowing that? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 18, it, it, it's an interesting verse. It's, it's actually a weird verse, so uh, we need to understand it this morning if, if we're going to be renovated. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Uh-oh. <laughs> we got to figure out what this means. How do we not regard anyone according to the flesh. Anyone who's saved, we don't regard them as the flesh. That, that means you came in here and, and, you, and you identify yourself, well, you know, I used to be this way. Well, you know, I did this bad thing. You know, so-and-so, they did No, we don't regard you in the flesh anymore. It's, it goes on to say, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, anyone who is in Christ, he's a new creation. Man, this is exciting stuff. This is the good news. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this is way better than we think. Just like you're more than you think, the church is more than it seems, this is, this is way better. Now, now, this seems like a weird verse, and we could skip over it, but God has given you victory. This verse means God has given us victory, and, and no longer, if you're a, a child of God, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you've been baptized into him, listen, we're no longer worried about what you, the old you. We're not even worried about the sin that, that you've done since you've become a Christian. Listen, we're not regarding you in the flesh. We're worried about your ministry, your kingdom work, 
your service. That, that, those are the things that we're concentrating on. But why don't you believe it? Why don't we believe it? I'm going to attempt to sum this verse up and help our ministry, your ministry, my. but I, but I also want to heal your heart at the same time. Some of you guys are like, I don't need my heart healed. Yeah, you do, tough guy. You do. You do. You're just too scared to think about it. Because whilst a lot of you may be strong physically, in here you don't deal with much. And, and so I want to tell you that I want to help your ministry and heal your heart at the same time. Are you ready? L listen, it's, it's about ready to get a little vicious in here. It's vicious because it isn't talking about somebody else. It's talking about the body of believers that gather together, that are the outposts for the gospel, that are the champions for Christ, that are carrying the banner of the Most High God. And it's about ready to get vicious in here. Here's why. You will never have a valid Christian testimony if you love being a victim. Okay, so I've got something I'm going to put on the board, and I want you to write it down, memorize it, and I want you to take it to heart because this is summing up this verse that, that, it, that was written to the people in Corinth. Okay, Kenny, if you could put it up. In Christ, you are no longer a victim. You're victorious with a testimony. Let's read it together. You read it with me right now. In Christ, you are no longer a victim. You're victorious with a testimony. You believe that? Why don't we believe that? Why? Because something bad happened to you, and, and you can't get over it, right? Some really nasty stuff. But, but I want to tell you something. It, it, you will never have a valid Christian testimony if you love being a victim. If you live as a victim, other people have to pay for their sin. And you have no victory in Christ. It's a biblical fact. Let me say it again. If you live as a victim, other people have to pay for their sin, and you have no victory in Christ. I told you it was about ready to get vicious. Because some of you can't forgive. You can't even forgive the people you live with. You can't get, forgive people in the community. You don't want to look at their face. You can't be around them. Why? I thought we had the good news and the victory in Christ. Why? Why do they get to be that way for us? Let's read Galatians. You know, Galatians uh, 2, chapter 20 through 21 is our next verse. A lot of people look at uh, Galatians as the, the guide for Christian living. Well, let's see what it has to say. It says, I have, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose, no reason. Well, what does this mean? Well, I bet if I asked the question, who here has lived through some hard times, some life? I bet I'd get a lot of response. I bet a lot of people, because I don't think it matters where you're at. I don't think it matters how old you are. A lot of people have dealt with hard things, almost everybody. This, this world is cruel. It's got a life expectancy, and it's not going down without a fight. But listen, you have the light of the gospel. Let me ask you something. Did somebody steal from you? Did somebody lie about you? Did someone cheat on you morally? Did someone take something that was yours and ruin it? Did somebody take a day or a life that was supposed to be different, and, and, and somehow you're living one that you didn't want? Well, you know what? At the time of the law of Moses, what, what this Galatians verse is talking about, before they ever had a king, do you know somebody would have to pay for that? Yeah. Justice would have to be done. Those people had to pay when they be, uh, bear false testimony, when they committed adultery. They'd have to pay with their life. And, and some of those people that stole and things like that, they would have to pay. That law didn't bring the righteousness, but it showed us what righteousness was, what sin was. And, and in the time of Moses, they'd have to pay. And you might think you would like that. You might think so. Because of what happened to you. Because of the things that happened to you day by day. You, you like people to be held accountable. But let me just tell you something. You'd like that until you'd be found guilty. You'd like that until you found out you're guilty too. And let me tell you, you are. So am I. All of us are guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. All, every single person in here. Over and over and over and over again. And you'd like somebody else to be held accountable for their sin right up, you think you would, right up until the time it's, it's time for you. You know, 
A lot of people think, well, you know, I just, somebody else, they sin worse than me. You know, what they did was worse. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. No one is wise enough to see the extent of their sin. I can't see how my sin hurts people over and over and over and waves through the generations of their family, but it sure does. Just because I'm not wise enough to see it doesn't mean it's not true. And when you want someone else to pay for their sin, you're absolutely not going to experience the blessing of Christ. And your, your testimony is, is never going to be valid. You know, Jesus went and preached the Sermon on the Mount just to show us how big a trouble we were in. He, he said things like, like this. You heard it was said you shouldn't commit adultery, but I'll tell you, if you look at a woman, if a woman looks at a man lustfully, that you've sinned in your heart, uh-oh, whoops. Wait, I thought I had to commit adultery. No, you just look lustfully at a person, and now you've committed that. You need the forgiveness of God. Uh, you, you heard said, don't murder In the Old Testament, murder means don't kill without justification, the justification that's explained in the book of Leviticus. But he says, I tell you, if you have unforgivable anger in your heart against a person, you're in danger of judgment. Whoops. Why, I thought I had to murder. Jesus said, just because you're too chicken to murder somebody, if you got that kind of hate in your heart, you're in danger of judgment. You sin. You're in trouble. You thought they were the only ones in trouble, but you're going to find out that you're in trouble. And so... And so then the good news come. We're talking about being renovated. But, but do you know how to be renovated? Do you know how to be remade? Do you know how to be re- reborn and, and have parts of your life saved? You may need to start by turning areas of your life from a victim to a victorious testimony. Amen? I mean, how many people need that? How many people, you you can't minister the gospel, you can't bring the good news when you're a victim in this culture. Do you think Paul, when he was telling us that he'd been shipwrecked, whipped, beaten, robbed, left for dead, naked, stoned to death, all this stuff that he was talking about victim? No, it was his testimony. That's worse than what you've been through. And it happened over and over and over. Jesus doesn't say he's a victim on the cross. No, it's the testimony of the entire Bible. It's the culmination of all the things that we're condemned for. What about the bad things that happen to you? I mean, the really nasty ones. Are you a victim or is that your victorious testimony? God has flipped the script. He's taken your soul and the things that wage war against it, and he turned it to a good thing. He turned it to an eternal salvation for other people. When we live such good lives, they come to us and they say, uh, you know, no, if you're a Christian, you're walking around, yeah, you know, everything that happens to me is the worst. You know, look. Yeah, it happened to me again. Huh. That doesn't sound like victory, good news. It sounds like you complaining and whining and crying all the time. And and listen, I'm not getting down. We need to come into the church and lift each other up. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about sharing with each other and being lifted up by a brother or sister in Christ. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm talking about where do you live and what do you think about what happened to you? What do you think about your life? Are you a victim or are you victorious testimony? A part of the bride of Christ, more than you think you are. Helping save the people that are in the world on a sinking ship that can have nothing but the judgment of God. Who are you? I think it's important to to fix who you are. To be transformed and renewed, to be renovated. You may need to start by turning your areas of your life from victim to victorious. And I think it could start this morning. You know, I think when you're ready this morning, uh, just like we always do, we're going to take communion. We get up to take it, but, but this morning you notice the stage looks a little different, right? Stage looks a little different. Well, we've got a little project because um, when you're talking about turning from a victim, you're talking about I hold other people accountable. I want someone else to pay. I can't move forward in my ministry because I'm a victim. Bad things happen to me. Somebody mistreats me. God has said that doesn't get to own you anymore if you love Christ. If you'll believe him, if you'll believe what he says, that doesn't get to, I've given you good news, victory. Not kind of good news, not sometimes good news, not every once in a while good news, not victory on a Sunday. But listen, a lot of us live by Wednesday, we're in the gutter. We're letting the things drag us down. Oh, yeah, I've got everything I want. Bad things happen to me. Someone I cared about died. No, it's, it's a ministry. 
It's a victorious testimony. It's not victim. And here's the thing. As we get, get ready for communion, the amazing gift that Jesus gave to us after he sent it into heaven was the Holy Spirit. And, and some of you need to get really good at listening to the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? What, what can the Holy Spirit do for us this morning? It can convict us of things where we hold people accountable, where we ruin our testimony because we're a victim. The Holy Spirit this morning can, if you let him, in the first service and the second, you're going to find there's some writing on this pages already. And I think before we go to communion to honor the Lord Jesus and the things that he did for us, shedding his blood and his body being broken, listen, we need to let the Holy Spirit speak to us, and, and the Bible tells us it's healthy to confess our sin before each other, the brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it's good to leave what in the past has made us a victim to what's going to give us a victory, what's going to turn into a victorious testimony this morning. It's good to leave that here. I'm not talking about signing it or anything like that, but I am talking about getting rid of it. Some of us do not know how to get rid of this stuff. But you've been walking around with abuse and pain and lying and stealing and cheating. And not only do you not forgive yourself, right? You don't forgive other people. Somebody needs to pay. They don't need to pay. Jesus paid that. He paid it for you and he paid it for them. And you need to quit sinning in that way. And I do, I do too. And, and, and listen, we do that together. Every single time somebody's going to write something on this board this morning, somebody else is going to be encouraged to start changing their life for Christ. Amen? Some of you have been prompted almost all the way through this message, and you know what needs to end up on this board, and you need to leave it. And you need to leave it there before you enter the communion of heaven. The thing that mirrored in the, in the city of heaven before God right now, it's being mirrored, this communion because of Christ. And it would be healthy for you this morning to accept the victorious testimony and leave the sin here. Leave the victim here. It's true bad things have happened. It's true they're not fair. This world, the destination is known and it's the wrath of God. Leave the things that belong to the wrath of God here this morning. Let me tell you, it will be the Christian's who can hear the Holy Spirit speak to them this morning that are involved in this. I want to encourage you to take the whole rest of the time of the, the service to, to take part in this. My prayer before I preach this message is that some of you this morning would take whatever thing has made you a victim and change it with a stroke of a pen to admission to God, to go before him with the conscience of the Holy Spirit convicting you, for that to change to a victorious ministry, I think we could do it together. God, you're more than you think you are. God's church is more than you thought it was. It's gonna be around till the victory of Christ is signaled by the trumpet and Jesus comes again. It's the good news, and we need to be part of it. Let's pray for communion. Lord, we thank you for your amazing gospel this morning, the amazing opportunity that you tell us we're not a victim. You have replaced our victimhood, the sin, the law, with an amazing, victorious testimony that when we watch our lives, other people get saved because of us. Lord, help us believe the truth of the gospel, that we were more than we thought we were. Help us lay some of these victims, some of our sin at the foot of the stage of the cross at your feet before we even take your communion this morning. I pray this for the health, for the growth, for the ministry of this local gathering of believers. Lord, under your city of heaven, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.